wanted to thank everybody that's here um, for joining us with this special meeting on indoor air quality and COVID-19 with Air Force One, um, hosted by AFCOM Central Ohio chapter. A um, little bit of background, I saw Greg Guy's post on uh, IAQ and PHI, and I thought um, this couldn't be a better time to have this conversation, <laughs> um, especially when we're getting into winter months here and we're getting ready to kind of all go inside and not be outside pretty much if it's if, if it's uh if it looks anything uh at your house like it does here um you're not pretty much not going outside for a while so um since we're stuck inside we ought to think about how we're going to deal with that um hopefully most folks have already taken a stab at that um obviously we can all um you know use personal protection personal protective equipment and follow best practices but there are other things that we could be doing and that's kind of what i had asked um air force one to help us out with when i reached out to greg guy and uh uh wanted to kind of like see if we could get them to talk for us and give us some guidelines best practices and some uh you know just some good guidance on how to how to deal with indoor air quality in uh, commercial settings and maybe even might even cross over to residential settings a little bit too so um just one minor bit of chapter business so uh, this isn't on our agenda here but um uh, we just found out that our uh ohio valley chapter um will be uh hosting and actually will be joining uh will be joining them as a co-host to host a virtual meeting on modernizing PNC banks, UPS topology. Um, that's going to be sponsored and arranged by Legacy Investing and T5 data centers. That will be on December 15th, and I'll, I'll be sending an invite out through the chapter uh, email on that. So uh, keep an eye peeled for that one. Um, if you're not on our email list, um, if you're here um, as a guest or you found this link or somebody invited you and you want to be on our email list, um, please contact us at our chapter email. That's the one that would have sent this invite out through the Eventbrite um, and uh, or reach out to me directly um, either way. Um, anybody here should be able to kind of get you in touch with us. Um, Central Ohio at AFCOM.com, all one word. Uh, you could reach us. I'll get you on, on the email list and we can get you. Uh, you know, kind of in the loop on all these uh, on our next meeting. So um, I'll stop talking now. We don't really have much else. Um, I didn't intend this to be a full AFCOM meeting. This is more of a kind of pull it together quick, get some good information in front of folks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let Brian Taylor and Austin Nutter take it away. And uh, I think Greg Guy would like to give us a quick intro as well. So I'll let him take it and uh, I'll uh, turn it over to those guys. Great. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Uh, so I'm Greg Guy. I'm the owner of Air Force One. It's a privilege to be with you guys today, uh, virtually at least. Um, so, you know, we, we're thrilled to be able to help in any way we can. Um, it's just the bottom line. So hopefully this information that we'll share is helpful to you. And um, I wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay well. With that, let me uh, send it over to my colleagues, Brian and Austin. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm Austin Nutter. Um, I will be presenting today um, with the help of Brian Taylor. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, this presentation typically runs about 30 minutes long um, with a 10 minute Q&A afterwards. Um, we recommend and we look forward to receiving questions during the presentation. So um, as questions come up, please hit the chat button. Brian's going to be monitoring those because um, we'd like to hit those in line um, of the discussion and the topic so we have the proper context. So uh, without any further ado, um, let's just jump right in. So um, today we're going to cover a few key topics, uh, ventilation, system filters, routine system maintenance and cleaning, water treatment, improving indoor air quality and photo hydro ionization. So the first topic we're going to discuss is ventilation, um, and you guys have probably heard this thus far, whether it's through the CDC, ASHRAE, or the state of Ohio. Um, they've been recommending to increase outdoor air um, into facilities when at all possible, um, and there's really two primary goals for that. Um, you know, the, the basic fundamental reason why we, we bring in and control ventilation is for building pressure, but more importantly, in this COVID world we're living in, 
Um, it's to increase the IQ by diluting the polluted or stale air indoor. Um, so what we know is this virus has a hard time living outdoors. So uh, with the recommendations of the CDC, State of Ohio and ASHRAE, um, they've asked to increase, you know, so let's say you're running 15 to 20 percent of outside air. Um, they recommend increasing it to about 30 percent. Um, and there is some caveats to that, and I think Brian Taylor would like to kind of jump in on this topic and describe it a little bit further. Yeah, thanks, Austin. <clears throat> um, of course, more airflow and air change in your space is always good, um, but some of those, um, sometimes that comes with a, uh, a cost, and, and that cost is energy use and um, equipment, um, the amount of work your equipment has to do. So as you start increasing outdoor air, um, you have to put more heat into the into the air to reheat it um, during the winter time, and you're having to use more tonnage of your cooling to cool it during the winter or summertime. So um, it puts a heavier burden on your equipment and um, on the KWs you use for energy. So we'll we'll get into some other options later on um, that that will help offset this. But uh, you know, ventilation being a key item with with COVID, I think it's something that everybody's thought about. Um, probably increased as far as you can and then uh, um, you know going from there and if you haven't taken a look at it or increased outdoor air um, we do recommend that you have somebody come out um, and review your intake system make sure the dampers are operating properly um, we know that this is sometimes the first thing that's kind of disconnected and controlled manually so you want to keep that in mind So the next the next topic is system filters, and this is kind of a point of contention. And back in March, when we were getting questions from various organizations, um, it was it was it was the topic of concern. There's a lot of contradictory information out there. So, you know, system filters obviously is something you need to do. It keeps your system operating efficiently and prevents contaminants from being reintroduced. Um, the one thing. Um, and the catch 22 to this is a lot of the recommendations were for higher rated filters such as HEPA or MERV 13. Um, and, you know, what we like to say and the reason we kind of developed this whole, you know, presentation is just simply switching to high efficiency filters is very dangerous. Uh, your mechanical equipment is, is designed for a specific pressure drop and a specific filter. So when you go in and replace a filter with a higher rated filter, you might actually be doing more um, of a detriment to your mechanical system than, you know, actually mitigating the spread of COVID-19. And Brian, would you like to kind of expound on that that slide? I mean, um, bottom line um, it is as you go up in filter rating, your pressure drop goes up and the amount of airflow um, to the system goes down. Now, some equipment, um, depending on the type of fan design and, and how it's designed, you can you know, up to speed in your VFD, um, change your pulley rating, and get the same amount of airflow um, at, at the cost of a little bit extra work. Um, now, when you start talking about like chilled water and hot water systems, um, not such a big deal if your fan's moving a little less air um, because it's just gonna, you know, you're, you're not gonna have quite as much effectiveness in your, in your space when it comes to heating and cooling. When you start talking about gas heat or more specifically um, package DX, uh, which a lot of data centers have, you now um, you're reducing the the feet per minute across your um, de your uh, um, evaporator coil, and um, it starts wreaking havoc on um, your compressors, your TX TXVs, and the the entire refrigeration cycle. Um, it could cause um, um, cycling, and at the end of the day, um, if you don't have the proper airflow, um, it's it's a trickle down effect. Every part of that piece of equipment could be at jeopardy of uh, um, failure or a higher rate of failure um, because you're not moving the proper air. So it's something that you really have to think about before you just go throw filters in. Um, what is the, you know, the, the unintended consequences? Right, and, and one of the things that, you know, the point, point of this slide, the message that we have been given our, our customers is that yes, you know, system filters are essential. Um, maintain quarterly system filter changes um, but it's somewhat unnecessary to um, increase, you know, filter ratings from, let's say, a MERV 8 to a MERV 13. Um, so if anybody has any questions for that, I, that might be a good start to, to ask a question in chat. And I will ask Brian. Brian, has any questions come in thus far? 
No, no. As soon as I see any, I'll, I'll certainly uh, um, wave my hand and make sure that we answer it in line so it has context. Sounds good. So routine system cleanings. Uh, this increases equipment efficiency and aids in the redu in reducing premature failure of equipment. Um, if it's not part of your regiment, it, we definitely recommend that you know you do clean your air ducts and coils to minimize dust and allergens. Um, these are known to spread viruses and bacteria. Um, we have listed some additional, you know, recommendation cleanings that we have. Um, but most importantly, um, if you're maintaining a, a proper regimen of preventative maintenance, you're going to extend the operating life and reduce the likely catastrophic failure of your equipment. And I think that's the main point to this slide. Brian, would you have anything to add to this? No, you kind of hit you kind of hit every point on that one for sure. Sounds good. Now this one we're just going to touch on. Um, we know a lot of environments are different. Not everybody has an open or closed loop water water system. Um, if you do, um, you certainly want to make sure you have a, you know established a plan to and execute you know a defense against key contamination issues. The main thing that kind of coincides with water treatment is Legionella or Legionnaires disease. Um, it's been front and center in news, whether it's locally or in Disney at Disney. Um, so we want to make sure that if you do have um, any kind of water system that you do have a plan in place. Right. Um, Brian, you got anything? Well, yes, yeah, specifically in, in, in the data center world. Um, I assume there's a lot of uh, um, humidity or steam humidity generators. Um, it's really important to make sure that that water is treated, the RO systems um, are working as they're supposed to, and that you're not putting contaminated um, water into your space or, or moisture into your space. Um, the thing, same thing goes, um, one of the recommendations was maintaining humidity, which um, funny kind of lands right at um, where most data centers want to run uh, between 40 and uh, um, I think 60, 60 being a little bit high, 40 starting to get a little bit low, but uh, uh, 50 percent being the the midpoint there um, maintaining that 50 percent um, helps in keeping a cleaner air environment um, specifically with COVID. thanks brian so, so guys I have, a, I, I have a question on that uh, okay. this is mike welch um so it's interesting it's not something i had really thought much about of before COVID um came to us but um the idea that increasing humidity is a benefit to, uh, you know, avoiding uh, airborne pathogens. Right. Could you guys talk a little more about that? <coughs> yeah, and and um, for sure, um, we're 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 coming at this from the point of of an HVAC um, and your mechanical systems, um, and and we're definitely not epidemiologists, but. Um, the CDC, um, the state of Ohio, um, have all recommended um, maintaining um, minimum 40%, but above 50% of possible. The closer to 60, the better. Um, for some reason, um, the, the virus doesn't thrive as well in a higher humidity environment. Um, it's it's a meantime to deactivation when it's on a hard surface in a higher humidity environment is significantly less than it is in a drier environment. So. Um, it definitely um, helps. Um, it's not a silver bullet, of course, but uh, it's it's part of airflow, um, moisture, and as we move on here, um, all tools in your tool belt to combat and make your your workplace safety healthy. I'm it, sorry. And that's a great question, and I would like to add to that as well. Um, and it kind of goes back to filtration. Um, you know, a lot of recommendations were for filtration. And what people um, didn't realize is that, you know, relative humidity plays an important role in how this virus is transmitted. So in arid climates, um, Southern California, New Mexico, where, you know, relative humidity is rather low, um, this virus has a tendency to um, stay in the air longer. We know this virus is spread through respiratory droplets, uh, and the more humidity you have in the air, um, the less likely it is to travel. The less humidity, the more likely it is to make it back into your HVAC system. Um, but as far as you know, being in Ohio, um, the reality is it's, it's it's a small likelihood that it actually makes it back to your HVAC system. 
Right. We'll and, kind of talk about that later on in the slides. Yeah, and, and I, I would like to add one more piece. Um, with that increased airflow, um, especially in the winter months, you're bringing in extremely dry air. Um, if you if you don't have the ability to generate um, humidity, um, you could be putting your um, infrastructure at a higher risk. So um, it's a balancing act. Cool, thank you. Yep. So now we'll move on to kind of the meat of the presentation. We covered, you know, kind of the standard um, practices of, of what every, um, you know, commercial environment, data center, even residential, you know, offices should have in place. But really what we want to know is how do you improve indoor air quality? Because to improve the health, because it improves the health, productivity, and well-being of its occupants. Um, air, purific air purification products reduce pollutant levels. That is known. Um, adding PHI or photohydroionization is the only way to properly disinfect air streams. And we'll kind of unpack that a little bit more. Um, but research does suggest that PHI will stop the spread of bacteria, germs, and fungi such as COVID-19. There's also some really um, good benefits. Um, one of them is the PHI is considered a green technology, and this kind of goes back to the ventilation slide. Um, you know, we're being asked to increase ventilation or outdoor air in our facilities because um, what we know is what's outside is good, right? Um, and we'll kind of talk about the naturally occurring hydroperoxides that exist in nature. Um, but with PHI uh, and the insulation of it, we can actually back down that outside air that's coming in. So we're not tempering the hot or cold air. Therefore, we can actually reduce energy consumption. Um, another added benefit is that it reduces odors um, and harmful VOCs. So I know this is something um, that Brian will want to touch on and we'll kind of expound on the PHI technology as the slides progress. Okay. Um, yeah, I really want to touch on um, PHI, and, and I know we'll go deeper into it. Um, please note that um, with PHI, we're kind of covering, and I'm sure everybody on this call um, has has heard of this, um, PHI specifically, which is photohydronization, but that technology encompasses um, cold, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, cold plasma? Yeah, cold plasma. Um, BPI and um, a couple of other technologies. It's all rolled up into one. Um, it is the only one that actually produces the H2O2, which which we'll we'll show you later. Actually, truly disinfects a space uh, based on medical research. So a little graphic um, to kind of show you the flow of how this works is. Uh, PHI or photohydroionization are physical units that are installed into your existing HVAC systems or crack systems. Um, we typically install these on the supply side um, of that equipment. Uh, and in the process, it's rec recreating the outdoors indoors um, by eliminating 99% of airborne pathogens, disinfecting airstreams, and hard surfaces. Um, over the next couple slides, we'll show you how that kind of works. Um, but you'll see why, you know, the technology itself is truly powerful. So you might be asking yourself, how does it work? Um, in a nutshell, it creates advanced oxidation processes, um, mainly hydroperoxides, also known as friendly oxidizers, meaning that these um, oxidizers interact with the pollutant, neutralize them, and then revert back to oxygen after the oxidation has taken place. Now, we have used germicidal UV light rays for many, many decades in the med medical industry. They, we know it destroys germs, viruses, and bacteria. Um, the caveat being that UV light is only effective in reducing microorganisms that pass through the light rays. Um, as we've discussed earlier in this presentation, the likelihood that um, the virus actually makes it back into your HVAC system um, as long as you're maintaining, you know, that 40 to 60 percent humidity is is slim to none. So we need to find a way to actively disinfect the airstream and, and hard surfaces, um, and which PHI can do um, to the tune of 99.9 percent in the air and all on all hard surfaces. All right. So 
Austin, I really want to touch on a piece here. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on this call are familiar with UV lighting. Um, it's been used for, for a very long time in the medical industry and even in the um, uh, mechanical HVAC industry to um, do point of use um, disinfection. And, and specifically, um, when used in the mechanical world, um, you have UV lights, they're installed, um, the, the bulk of their energy and the, and the light rays are directed towards the um, face of your cooling coil because that's a wet coil and it can, um, being wet and, and constantly wet through cycles, um, you know, grows mold, bacteria, um, other um, contaminants, and that UV makes sure that it stays disinfected. <clears throat> There's a lot of misinformation out there where people actually think that the UV um, lights that are installed in your unit are disinfecting the air, um, which um, really um, is a misnomer because the velocity that the air moves and the fact that even at the microscopic level, um, they can shade each other um, to install enough UV in your piece of, in, in a piece of equipment to actually disinfect the airstream at a rate of, you know, let's say 99% or above would be take an extreme amount of power. Um, the amount of light intensity would be so large that um, it would start to degrade anything that's not metal and, and even probably have an issue with metal um, down the road. So any plastics, any any type of um, caulk um, sealers that are in that unit would degrade and it would actually make your equipment um, fail. So UV lights are great at point of use. Um, you want to disinfect um, a surface. You want to disinfect the phone. You want to put something, you know, you want to pass an object through UV with at a speed in which it can disinfect it, it's great. Disinfecting an airstream, it really doesn't work that way. Thanks, Brian. So results, um, obviously um, we want to have proof of concept. Does this, the, does, does PHI or photohydroionization actually neutralize viruses? And in addition to COVID-19, which we'll discuss here briefly, um, it's been tested against 20 or 30 other strands, um, the swine flu, H1N1, MRSA, just a couple, to, you know, just to name a few. So this, this report recently came out and what they looked at was um, how well photohydroionization worked to neutralize SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Um, within a controlled environment, this is a third party test, um, they had a culture of, of, of COVID-19 um, the chamber or the area that they were conditioning had no PHI installed. So on our hour, hour zero, PHI is installed, um, it kicks on, and within less than two hours, the virus was neutralized by 99.9%, meaning that at that point, should you maintain the saturation levels of PHI, um, it's going to greatly reduce the spread of COVID-19. And Brian, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Um one of the, the 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 interesting things to note here is that um, we have the white paper on the uh, um, bioanalysis laboratories report. Um, if if Michael would like to uh, distribute that, but uh, um, it was a fairly high level of of COVID in the test chamber. So it took a specific amount of time. Um, I think the next slide will show um, once your inactivation rate is you know, once you've had the, the PHI in the system and running for um, X amount of time, um, you know, a little, little less than two hours here, um, any reintroduction of the virus is neutralized instantly because it's it's a very small quantity. The PPM is very small. So um, I don't want anybody to, to be mistaken by the fact that it took two hours and to think that, well, if somebody walks in here and they have COVID and they sneeze, um, it, it's two hours until they're, um, there's a disinfection rate. Um, that's not the case because the, the, the third party test will show that uh, they reintroduced COVID to the chamber once it was um, neutralized and it maintained that um, deactivation level. And we also have a slide that kind of correlates with the sneeze tests and, and you know the aerosolizing of, of any kind of pollutant. So that will be two slides from now um, and we'll kind of talk about that then. Um, 
similar to any virus, um, PHA also has an, a very positive impact on mold, yeast, and bacteria, um, albeit take a little bit longer. Um, this third party test, again, um, install the PHI, get the units running, and within 48 hours, the inactivation rate was 97 plus. And this was the, the kind of the, the slide I was talking about. Um, essentially, this test was originally um, developed for the TSA. Um, there are beta um, cruise lines and airplanes um, that have PHI installed. Um, they're probably kicking themselves in the butt that they hadn't installed it sooner. Um, what this test basically simulated was the sneeze, the exact way that this, this virus is primarily transmitted. And what they found was um, once the air is saturated, kind of that ramp up period we talked about, whether it's two to six hours, depending on um, what pollutant you're trying to, to neutralize, um, it immediately kills those microbes within three feet by 99%. Yeah, very important. That's at the velocities of a sneeze. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, huge benefits um, when it comes to neutralization. So, um, you know, there was a lot less positive cases during the warmer months. We know that there's a reason for the flu season. Um, people start coming inside and congregating and we don't have that natural air that occurs. Um, essentially, what PHI does is it's 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 natural it's recreating what's naturally occurring in our environment. Um, the sun is a large UV source, and the atmosphere consists of quite a few different types of metals. Um, and the processes react together to create those hydroperoxides. There's a reason why we go outside; the air smells fresh. Um, but indoors, um, we the only way to create those hydroperoxides is through the technology such as PHI, or is also known as PCO. So, Austin, if you don't mind, um, what I want to do is, is right now is, is link um, how we talked about PHI being a green energy, the fact that the recommendation from the CDC is to increase outdoor air and how um, installing a technology like this um, can actually um, help you uh, get an ROI and then save money beyond that. And and very simply put, um, because you're creating the hydrogen peroxides and they're um, oxidizing in the space and turning back to oxygen, um, you can reduce your amount of outdoor air down to the minimum required for um, building pressurization. Um, the, the only caveat to that is um, you do need demand ventilation for CO2. It, it doesn't do anything for CO2, um, but um, if you have demand CO2, you can always maintain the least amount of outdoor air you need to maintain your CO2 level. And then um, because you have the, the PHI unit, um, it's taking care of all the other items that you would want to have um, flushed out in a normal air cycle. So, um, significant amount of savings, um, still get the benefits beyond just outdoor air and um, maintain efficiency of your equipment, which is, I think you tie those three things together and it's a, it's a pretty important piece. So with that, I mean, that's generally the, the, the biscuit when it comes to the presentation. Um, I would ask that if anybody is thinking about any questions or have any questions to ask them now. Um, if we don't receive some in the, in the next few minutes, then we can conclude this presentation um, and I can kind of talk about, you know, what the next steps are. Brian, have you seen anything come across? I have not. Michael, do you have Thanks, any guys. questions? Yeah, hey, this is Mike again. Um, hey, I'm wondering, do you guys have anything that shows us what the this kind of equipment maybe looks like, just so we can get a you know visualization of, of uh, you know, sure appearance. <laughs> Is that something that you could uh, pull up, Austin, and share on your screen? Um, yeah. While he's doing that, I'll I'll give an explanation. <clears throat> we didn't go into the the finite details of the piece of equipment, but uh, um. It's really a flange mounted um, device. It, it, it's uh, 
um, has a ballast in it that creates a, a higher energy electrical charge. Um, it runs a UV light, which is very low intensity, but directed towards a metal catalyst. And it's really cool that it, the UV light um, with the metal catalyst and then um, H2O, right, water, moisture that's in the air um, creates um, H2O2. So uh, really low power, um, quite honestly, uh, if you should, We'll just give an example, a 100,000 CFM unit um, takes about 2.2 amps of power. So it can be powered off of the control circuit or the piece of equipment that's already there. There's no need to add any racking to the unit. There's no need to add any extra power to the unit. Um, very, very low power requirements. Um, is the photo showing, Brian? No, all I see is the... Uh, um, We stop share and share again. I, mean, I can pull it up for share. There we go. Is it up now? There we go. I see it. Yep. So um, this is the LED version. What's really cool is um, this technology in the past had been um, specifically done with UV bulbs. Um, which we know have a, a very finite lifespan. Um, they've, they've finally figured out how to create the same spectrum of UV light with an LED. So it's it's changed over to LED. So it's actually brought the power requirements down even further. Yeah, and I'm guessing just my knowledge of UV bulbs, mercury vapor bulbs, they don't last very long. It's, it's, a, it's definitely a short lifespan, right? So I'm guessing the LED probably helps with that. Correct. And the traditional bulbs that were CMLs and mercury based had a finite lifetime of 18,000 to 25,000 hours. Um, you do some quick math on that. That's two years running, you know, 24 7, 365. Um, all environments are different. We typically interlock these to the system's fans. So um, should the system's fans be running, obviously the PHI unit is on and vice versa. Got it. And, and this isn't the only application they have. You know, there's multiple applications for various equipment. This just so happens to be one of the more common one that kind of fits that threshold of, of anything under, you know, 15 tons of cooling, um, which we see quite frequently. Can this kind of equipment actually be retrofitted in a data center crack or Yes. Or does it, does it really matter? It doesn't matter where it can pretty much go in on the supply side of any piece of any piece of HVAC equipment. Correct. Um, it, it can be installed um, upstream or downstream of the equipment. It's more effective if it's downstream of your, you know, the heating and cooling pieces and, and the fan. So the discharge side. But yes, yes. It, it can absolutely be um, installed. And um, the thing that you don't understand the size of that. Um, it's really only, a, I think, a three-inch hole, and um, it's not very large. It, it, it's a lot smaller than you would imagine. Great. Thanks. No worries. So if there's no other questions, that kind of concludes um, the webinar. Now, just to confirm, Brian, has anything come over in chat? No, I have not seen any chats. OK, um, and then just kind of as a final final update um, this, you know, if you couldn't attend this webinar has been recording uh, and we will distribute that as well as the slide deck um, and feel free to reach out to Brian or myself. Should you have any questions? Um, this this type of technology is readily available. So if you're working with a current commercial HVAC company, um, feel free to ask them as well about the technology. Um, uh, guys, but, I did did have one kind of Two, two follow ups. Um, one okay. question, one one question, one comment. So earlier you mentioned that you guys have a white paper. Um, yep. Certainly um, folks, you know, reach out to the, these guys or, or me, you know, the AFCOM chapter directly and we'll get we'll get you in touch with that or get you a copy of the presentation. Other question, is there is there a way to kind of 
roughly figure what you might be into for cost on something like this? I mean, is it is it a very expensive technology? I mean, is it a for, is it is it relatively inexpensive for what you know? You mentioned the kind of offset between uh, the energy needed to deal with your indoor air and make up. You know, if you try to do it on the indoor on the makeup air side, you know, uh, the cost might be, you know, energy costs might outweigh the cost of a unit like this. So is there any rough estimate on how much something like this might cost? Yeah, I, I can give a baseline. Um, so if, you, if you're talking about one unit up to say roughly 15 ton, um, it's 1500 to $2,000. That's, that's um, your cost, right? Installed, uh, the whole nine yards interlocked. So um, the reason there's a little bit of a delta there is because you know, is the equipment installed outside? Is it installed inside? Does it need to have a waterproof housing or a NEMA 4 housing? Um, and then upwards to about six thousand dollars for for um, a hundred tons of uh, um, cooling, or you know, fit forty five thousand cfm of air. Yeah. So, so, so in an application like like I know we have a lot of, and probably everybody on this call has one of these. Like most of our cracks in our data center are twenty tons. Yep. Um, would you just put two units in one, for example, or? Yes, we would put two units in one. And uh, um, what's cool is it's adjustable for the output, so okay. we can match to the airflow, so you don't oversaturate. We, we try to stay in that, uh, um, was it 0.02%, which is what, um, yeah. you know, gives you the, the results that their alpha testing is based on. Gotcha. Great. Well, I have no further questions, and um, I thank you guys a lot for doing this. Um, I think it's, again, I think it's really timely. Um, hoping uh, this maybe gave folks a little bit of a view into the world you guys live in and, you know, a uh, little education on indoor air quality in terms of, you know, viral particles. Oftentimes, you know, in data center applications, we often think about things like humidity and dirt. And pretty much beyond that, we're basically happy if our uh, units are cooling and all of our IT equipment is is happy, right? In the in the right uh, kind of ASHRAE ranges and stuff. So, um, but but this is a nice uh, nice brief on the uh, on the options of the equipment. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and again, if anybody has any follow up questions, if any of your members are you, um, they can direct them to you. You can direct them to us. We'll answer any question that you guys have.